nothing endures but change. The world has changed considerably in the 2,500 years since the Roman author Heraclitus set down that line. On an individual level and on a societal level, we must all contend with change. It's the carnival of life, you see, that makes people the happiest. Change in a society can result from innovation, invention, or diffusion. In the most stable of cultures, innovation in design of tools and other objects can lead to subtle but pervasive changes in lifestyle over thousands of years. Western culture places a great value on invention, which is a conscious quest for alterations or improvements in design. Invention is an integral part of Western economy, which is based on growth generated by creation of a need for novelty. Change itself is a cultural value. Much culture change is the result of borrowing or diffusion. Groups of people have always borrowed from one another. However, improvements in communications and transportation technologies have accelerated the process of diffusion. Diffusion can produce mixed results, especially when introduced from outside a culture. For more than a thousand years, the intricate ecology of rice growing on the island of Bali has been regulated by a system of priests who time the cycles of planting and harvest according to a ritual calendar. At the pinnacle of the priestly hierarchy is Jirogade, the high priest at the temple of the water goddess at Lake Batur. Lake Batur is the source of an elaborate system of springs, lakes, and canals that ultimately channel water into each farmer's fields. This irrigation system, regulated by priests at the temple, has allowed the Balinese to grow several crops of rice each year without pesticides or artificial fertilizer. Several decades ago, International development organizations began intensive efforts to improve Balinese rice yields and increase exports. Techniques developed in research stations across Southeast Asia were introduced in Bali in hopes of increasing the island's productivity even further. Outside developers built new dams, new canals, changed the cropping patterns, brought in new rice varieties, and trained agricultural experts to spread the new techniques. They expected the economy to boom. Unfortunately, miracle rice produced miracle pests. Insecticides were brought in to fight invasions of insects and disease, but soil fertility declined. The grand experiment failed, in large part because it had failed to take into account the agricultural expertise encoded in the traditional priestly culture. In the traditional Balinese hierarchy, Wayan Paga is the elected head of 15 irrigation units. He oversees irrigation and cropping decisions for thousands of people. Whenever there is a problem or a dispute, the heads of the irrigation units get together to find a solution, which Wayan Paga must then implement. In making decisions about irrigation and the timing of rice cultivation, Wayan Paga consults both government officials and the priests at the temple of Lake Batur. Each year, the senior priests at the temple consult natural signs to estimate the likely length of the rainy season. Then, representatives of over 200 villages are summoned to the temple for a festival to mark the end of the rainy season. Through festivals, rituals, and distribution of holy water from Lake Batur, the priests set the irrigation clock for the year to come. In this way, rice cultivation is coordinated with seasonal rain cycles. Yet, even though this system has worked effectively for over a thousand years, the Balinese are quick to see the possibilities of a computerized system for regulating the rice cultivation cycle. Anthropologist Steve Lansing demonstrates the computer to Jirogade, the high priest of the temple. Jirogade quickly sees that information on cultivation cycles he had stored in his memory can now be stored in the computer. <laughs> Yeah. 
cukup enak. Iya nang matakan nah kenang berarti bulan mati sane kendador. Kendador kan. Berarti kan However, introduction of computers must accommodate traditional lines of authority. Government officials are quick to claim the new technology for themselves, using it to reinforce the power of the bureaucracy. Yang hadir sekarang di sini kan bapak-bapak tinggi, tinggi. Nah, mungkin untuk yang lebih tepatnya itu mungkin. Di bawah pohon sedang agung niki ya. Atau kini ya, agung kita kumpung sedang agung ya. Yes. Kita pilih masjid di atas. Masjid yes. di sampun munggar niki kan ubur ya. Manu abe mas. Abe gitu. Kita kumpul di sana. Nah itu saya lebih tepat. Lebih lebih tepat. Dan ipun dan masjid daya nak kena. But Jurogade proves to be as skilled at coping with the complexities of computers and government officials as with mediating the forces of nature. In other cases, change introduced from outside does not always take place so gracefully. The effects of colonialism are especially abrupt and disruptive. Colonialism involves the subjugation of one group of people by another. It typically results in culture loss among the people who have been conquered, as they are forced to adapt to a foreign way of life. Colonialism in some form has been part of the human experience since the rise of agriculture, with its capacity to produce a food surplus and support a standing army. In Africa's Kalahari Desert, the Kung Bushmen fight to retain rights to what remains of their traditional land. Several decades ago, the Kung, or Junt Wasi, were the last independent foraging group in southern Africa. All other so-called Bushmen people had been exterminated or dispossessed. By the middle of the 20th century, their traditional lands had been taken for use by white commercial farmers, mining companies, nature conservation, and game preserves. In 1951, Samko was 10 years old. Like all Juntwasi boys, he was learning to be a hunter. He was preparing for a lifestyle that was soon to disappear. In 1970, when Samko was just 29, Bushman land was drawn on a map. The border with Botswana was fenced, cutting the people off from 90% of their traditional land and all but one of their permanent water holes. Under the homeland's policy, the Namibian government gave much of the Juntwasi land to the Herero, another indigenous people. Another large portion of land was proclaimed a game preserve. There was no longer enough land to support hunting. The foraging economy collapsed forever. The Kung were forced to develop subsistence farming and herd cattle on what remained of their land. Tsamko is now a herdsman worried about his cattle. There is a continuing drought in the Kalahari, and two cattle from the village herd did not come back to the corral last night. The men found their cattle. The lioness was still on the kill, and very dangerous. This time she vanished when the men approached. The cow had been giving birth. The bull had cost the village much of its small earnings. In one two-month period, lions killed 23 cattle. These lions are the dogs of nature conservation. They say lions must live on our land. We're not allowed to hunt them. They don't live on other farmers' land. We say they mustn't live on our land either. Government officials are not sympathetic to the troubles of the struggling Kung farmers. We've got real big problems with lions killing our cattle. Come here, sir. If you have a problem, come to the Nature Conservation Office here. Tell them that a lion is killing your cattle, and they can go with you, or they can give you a permit. But it must be done right. Don't just go and shoot. But the Department of Nature Conservation did not help the Juntwasi protect their cattle. Lion attacks increased. In despair, the people began to risk their lives by killing the lions with poison arrows and spears. The government provided water for elephants, but denied it to the people and their cattle. 
John Marshall, who has spent many years filming the Juntwasi, was on hand when farmers decided to install a water pump. An army officer and a policeman brought an order from the attorney general in an attempt to prevent installation of the pump. Just a minute. What's the problem? Where's the, the written authority? They ask But me we don't you. need a written authority. He wants and people want water. Uh, in that case, in that case, we will stop you. We will personally stop you. Look, this pump is our business. We just ask John to help. Yes, but you understand. You can go on, but the pump will certainly be removed. The Juntwasi kept the pump, but their troubles were not over. Water supplied to elephants by the Department of Nature Conservation attracted more than 600 elephants into their land. The animals destroyed crops and pumps, but the people were not allowed to hunt them. Instead, the Department of Nature Conservation opened the territory to trophy hunting by wealthy Europeans and Americans. Licenses for trophy hunters poured money into the coffers of the central government, and enormous elephant carcasses rotting in the sun attracted more predators. The Juntwasi are classified as bushmen, which means they are considered part of the natural wildlife of the region. They have fewer legal rights than any other indigenous people of Namibia. They do not even have the protected status of lions and elephants. Besieged on all sides by drought, lions, elephants, and government officials, the Juntwasi have become politically active. They voted for the first time in the 1989 elections, and as a result of those elections, Juntwasi rights to their lands are now recognized. Juntwasi have organized themselves into a farmer's cooperative. As chairman, Tsamko called a meeting to discuss problems facing the people and to draw up laws for a local government. We know there are many Juntwasi without land at the police camps and in the Gobabas farms. If they can join us here, we can develop together like a strong tree. Our government must have rules so we can allocate our land and provide people with water. We've started our own drilling program, but we aren't satisfied just to have boreholes for ourselves. We want to help people who have no land, no water, nothing to eat. First, we must work to drill our own boreholes. Some of us own Morrissey without water. Then we must search outside for our relatives who have no land or hope. Our local government must be like the father and mother of Junwasi who have nothing, so we can give people Morrissey under our law. The meeting, which John Marshall compared to a constitutional convention, drew members of a United Nations monitoring team. Traditionally, Juntwasi inherited land rights from their parents. They are now adapting those inheritance rules to provide for the dispossessed. John Marshall wrote down the statutes as they emerged and translated them for the United Nations visitors. Uh, what if a Juntwa from Gobabas said my great-great-grandfather lived in a Nori here? So... Uh, it's mine. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna take it. Why do they have to ask the NNFC? Because he doesn't know his Nori. Because he doesn't have a Nori. Because there are many Junglasi like Damasi, and we couldn't have everyone just grabbing the Nori. We must have law first. If people grabbed land, it would mean there was no law. We must first have law and people who speak for the law before we can before we can uh, uh, allocate Nori spaces for people to live in. That's where we're at so far. On the other side of the world, in the tropical rainforest of Venezuela and Brazil, the Yanomamo are facing similar challenges. They are contending with a drastic form of culture change brought about by colonialism. Traditionally horticulturalists, the Yanomamo have long lived in isolation. In the 1980s, discovery of gold on Yanomamo territory in Brazil touched off a gold rush, bringing miners from all over the region. Anthropologist Napoleon Chagnon has studied the Yanomamo for several decades. He says mining threatens their traditions, their subsistence base, even their very lives. The impact on the Yanomama has been of several different kinds. The most obvious and perhaps the most devastating 
is the sudden change in the health and epidemiological patterns because when you bring in 50,000 new human beings into an area that only eight or nine thousand lived in on the Brazilian side you complicate epidemiological problems in the sense that many diseases that the Anamama had originally but were never epidemic suddenly flared up and became epidemic because there were so many new human beings that could transmit it. The miners also use techniques that involve suction pumps that suck water and mud out of the rivers usually very small rivers, they run this effluent through wooden troughs and add mercury compounds to it to amalgamate the gold, cause it to get heavier and sink to the bottom, which is what they're looking for, but they just simply let the residue flow back into the rivers. So they're contaminating the rivers with mercury, a problem whose dimensions we are still not sure of, but mercury is known to be a very toxic substance for humans and all forms of life. We probably have yet to see what the consequence of mercury contamination will be for the health and the future of the Yanomama, but unchecked, it could possibly be very devastating. The Yanomama are also becoming dependent on miners for food and other goods. At first, they give away tools, machetes, cooking pots, and begin providing the Anamama with food, things like rice and sugar. And eventually, particularly the younger men who don't like to make gardens to begin with, become very highly dependent on mining camps that are located near their villages, and so they stop planting. And when the miners stop giving them food and other goodies after enough miners get there and they can resist Yanomama demands, then that puts the Yanomama into a very unfavorable kind of relationship with the miners. They no longer are given the handouts that they originally got when the Yanomama outnumbered the miners, and they have failed to plant their crops, so they become destitute. Before the miners arrived here, the Indians lived their normal life. They lived in the jungle. But now they have more comforts, they have more food, and the gold miners bring them progress. They bring them food, clothes, all the things that they need. And the Indians adore the miners. The impression that people have on the outside is that the miners fight with the Indians. This is not true. The Indians love the miners, and the miners like the Indians. Anthropologists fear that with their subsistence base destroyed and with their new dependency on trade goods brought by the miners, the Yanomamo will someday join the millions of dispossessed people who congregate in urban slums throughout the world. And some Yanomamo themselves believe the miners have brought death to the human race. Many people ask for the white men's things. I say to them, don't ask for those things. The miners are only going to lie to you. They have already killed some of our people at Papiu. They are very fierce. When there are enough of them, they are going to kill us. That is what I say, but no one hears me. In southern Mexico, Mayan subsistence farmers are contending with more subtle forms of culture change. The Maya practice slash and burn agriculture on small plots of land farmed by extended families. Anthropologist Hubert Smith has studied the Maya of Chican for a number of years and has returned many times to record changes in their way of life. There have been a lot of changes in Chican. Uh, not the least of them roads. A road system that's vastly improved makes it much easier for people in the village to go out and work in other cities periodically, and they do more and more of them. And it makes it easier for people to come into the village, certainly people who have things to sell. I guess the second biggest change has been electricity. That came in in 1978, just as we were leaving. It's now been here almost two decades, and, and the changes here are vast. It used to be that uh, your day ended at uh, nighttime, unless, of course, you wanted to burn a candle or fumble around in the darkness. Well, now the day can extend as long as anybody wants it to. And, of course, with electricity for the pumps, 
water now reaches everybody's house. Audemaro is back home. He left school. He didn't like it. He couldn't stand to be away from the family, basically. Entonces, este, ya escogiste la vida aquí en la milpa y no parece tan duro. Ah, sí, ya, ya escogí. Es que prefiero terminar acá trabajando. Pues, tenemos vida acá, pues, estamos trabajando en la milpa. Sí. Y también, este, trabajar con su papá es, es, siempre es fácil o de vez en cuando... No, nosotros entre nosotros no hay pleito. Mm. Nada de pleitos. Trabajamos juntos. Romaldo uh, has been dead eight years. He stayed away from the village and worked in Merida and other places and uh, was in the town of Valladolid one evening with uh, some of his friends. They'd finished work. They were going out to have a coke and walking along the highway and a pickup truck came along, plowed into them, killed him, injured several others, and kept going. He was killed almost instantly. Uh, he was alive long enough to tell his friends to, to ask his friends, I guess, to, to promise to bring the news to his mother and father. Pues mi papá, pues, tardo en, 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 en dejar de pensar, porque cuando vea que salen los chambeadores, pues él empieza a pensar por qué le pasó a él. Si no hubiera pasado, pues, hasta estas horas puede salir también para ir a México. But taking a look at the town as a whole, it doesn't seem a lot different, at least uh, just to the casual eye. But there's one very, very important change, and it's hard to notice because so many of the houses are buried back here in the forest. But the population is up over 62%, yet the land base on which the community farms corn and squash and beans has remained fixed and it will never get any bigger. So what that means is where there were 60 families uh, farming corn before, there are now 110. There's a lot of pressure on the land and to a certain extent they've taken up the pressure by continuously applying more and more fertilizer to the land. Now, I'm no agricultural expert. I don't know if there's a point at which they'll reach uh, diminishing returns. Whereas in the past in Yucatan, when a community got too big for its land base, they used to split off and form a nuclear new community in another area where there was open land. They don't want to do that anymore. People are too attached to the improvements that have taken place in this community. Right about now, a lot of you seeing video games and uh, roads and people driving up and down these simple streets and cars might be thinking gosh i wonder what's happening is life being destroyed here Amer americans are ambivalent about what they consider to be their cultural artifacts uh, coming into a, a life that appears to be much simpler i don't know I, i'm ambivalent about it too but i don't think the changes have been that impressive or that drastic and certainly not that hurtful of the things that are, I think are most valuable here. Now, to be sure, a friend of mine the other day did, did say, how come the people who make television programs allow so much sex and violence to go on when children are watching? I thought that was a pretty good question and one that a lot of North Americans ask. I, I don't guess that people have much more control here than, than we do. But the question I was asking 20 years ago was something like, as changes like this take place, do parents and children move inexorably apart? Do the values of the parents somehow become less and less important to their children, and do the children reject them and uh, turn to other occupations, other ways of thinking? Certainly many more young men, as many as 60, leave here every Monday morning to go to Merida to work all week long in construction jobs. But the interesting thing is they come home every Saturday just to spend Saturday night and Sunday at home. Then they go again. And all of these young men who are out of the village much of the time have cornfields. They pay other people who stay in the village to maintain their cornfields. So in a sense, their identification with corn farming, which of course is the basis of this culture, remains strong. So I guess the interim verdict is change, yes. There's been a lot of it. Disruption. No, there's been very little. 
I'm in the somewhat odd position of having been proved wrong. My expectations were that Western culture would move in here, give these people a good shaking up and change their lives forever. They've decided to not let that happen. And after all, they've been around for many, many more centuries than we have. And they themselves say they're liable to be here long after we're gone. All societies change. Indeed, the ability to change may be part of the survival mechanisms of all human groups. The ability of traditional people to adapt to the dramatic changes that threaten to engulf them is impressive. But not all change improves life for all people. Technological change is taking place more rapidly than ever before, but people have not changed biologically for at least the last 50,000 years. Is this prehistoric animal, the human being, adapted for the world it has created? Anthropologists disagree on the answer to this important question. But all anthropologists acknowledge that culture change is inevitable. And when it does not endanger the dignity of human life, or overwhelm our ability to absorb it, change may even be eagerly sought by the people whose lives are most profoundly affected. Thank you.